Okay, um, I want to be respectful of everybody's time, uh, so I'll just go ahead and uh, get started here. This is David McMahon. I'm the uh, CEO of OcuSci. Uh, thank you very much for joining us today. Appreciate it. I think uh, you'll get a lot out of it. And uh, without uh, further ado, I'll introduce uh, Brittany McMurrin, who is going to be our first speaker. And um, uh, just a, a housekeeping issue there. If you could uh, mute the phones so that we don't get uh, feedback and other noises while we're uh, speaking. And uh, at the end, just hold your questions. At the end of Brittany's uh, presentation, we'll have some time for questions. And um, I think you can also type them in uh, on your screen as well. So um, you can go ahead and mute your phones. So uh, I guess we'll cover the agenda first. Um, so we're going to talk about um, how to improve dry eyes in 30 days. This is a clinically proven protocol that um, Dr. McMurrin was um, involved in that clinical study. Uh, I think she had about a third of the patients, if memory serves. So she uh, has firsthand experience with that, and she can talk about our published study there. And then I'm going to talk about uh, nutrient deficiencies that are impacting eye health. Uh, so we'll get into some specifics. And, you know, some of this is very timely with COVID and, uh, you know, what we can do to improve our uh, immune system and, and just overall health, not just eye health. Uh, and then I'll take a little bit of time to talk about new products. Uh, so uh, it's been my pleasure to know uh, Brittany McMurrin for. She's probably the past seven or eight years. Um, she is the chief of clinical research uh, and partner at Warner Optometry. And uh, she's a graduate of Illinois College of Optometry. Uh, she's founded three successful dry eye clinics. Um, I know I, I've worked with her at two of those. And I, I called her an intrepid uh, dry eye researcher because She's been involved in every uh, meibomian gland device that's been developed in the past five years. Uh, so really a wealth of knowledge um, on the different devices, and not to mention drops and supplements and other things as well. Um, she consults, you know, nationally, uh, internationally, and uh, is involved in a lot of clinical trials, as I mentioned. Um, and she added that uh, I didn't know she was a uh, woodworker as well, so a, a woman of many talents. Um, so I'll let uh, her go ahead and take over from here, and I'll be uh, advancing her slides, so hopefully we can uh, find the rhythm here. Um, take it away, Brittany. All right. Hi there. Uh, thanks for joining us. We're talking about dry eye because everybody's talking about dry eye. Um, like you said, I am California-based. At the time, I was born in Shanslin New Vision Institute when we were doing this study out in La Jolla, California. And we were one of six sites seeing patients for this. And this study was very simple, very straightforward. And the treatment was very simple and straightforward. And that's the beauty of the protocol is how simple it is. And I'll get back to that, but um, go ahead and advance slide for me. Thank you. So, as you know, dry eyes becoming an increasing problem worldwide due to, I don't know if any of you read that from cover to cover, but um, anywhere from five to 6% of the population has dry eye disease. That's a really big range. Um, dig a little deeper. The NIH comes up with 7 to 33% of the U.S. population having dry eye disease. And my personal opinion, I still think that's under counting, but let's be conservative and split it down the middle. Call it 20%. Oh, no, come back. <laughs> uh, so right now, there are 30, 330 million people in the U.S and if 20% of them have dry eye, that's 66 million people. There are less than 40,000 apartments in the US. 
which means we each would have to take care of 1,700 dry eye patients a year individually. That's a ton. Granted, we're not going to see all of them because not all of them will get to our share, but what we can do is treat the ones that are coming into our offices already. And this is a really simple way of doing it. So it's a really big deal in optometry right now. And what's interesting is, go ahead and slide for me. The general public is also very interested in dry eyes. So here is a Google trend graph. I don't know if you've ever used those, but it's a sliding scale um, that 100% is the highest search term rate. And then it self-adjusts compared to that. So this is looking at the last five years and just Googling search term dry eye. You can see it's almost doubled in the last five years. And you can also see that it's not going away. People are still very interested in this. And the more they're educated about it, the more they want to find out. And I'm sure you can see there's a little drop there around March 1st, 2020. I'm sure you can guess what everybody else was Googling that day instead of dry eyes. Um, but this is going to be something we're going to have to manage for a lot of people for a very long time. Go ahead, advance for me. Hey, Brittany, it's Dave. Um, are you able to move closer to your microphone? It's a little, little broken up. Sure. Is that better? <laughs> I th yeah, I think that's better. Thank you. Okay. So, back to our very simple, straightforward study where we're looking at a heat mask and omega-3 supplements as a treatment for dry eyes. Who are we looking at at the study? Well, this is who we're not looking at. We wanted not to have any participants that had um, lid deformities, if they had lid movement disorders, anybody that was having issues with current ocular allergy, if they had other ocular disease states, or if they had a previous ocular condition that had lasting sequelae like corneal uh, scarring, undertable scarring, and anybody that was taking the thesis, anybody that was taking a blood thinner, morphine, morphine, a contact lens wear, anybody that was pregnant or lactating, and obviously anybody that had a main allergy to omega-3 fatty acids, and I actually have not met one of those. I'm sure they exist somewhere. You can be allergic to anything, but, um, and anybody that had punctal occlusion. We didn't want to muddy the waters with other treatments, making our data look better than it should or worse than it should. So to keep things clean, this is how we weeded out candidates. Let's go ahead and change the slide. Thank you. So this is who we did end up with. We ended up with 35 participants, two of them dropped out, um, 24 women, nine men, and we were recruiting patients from the age of 18 to 75. What we ended up with was an average of 52. And I'm actually really happy with where this average ended up because I don't know about you, but age 40 to age 65 is a huge chunk of the demographic in my office. So that meant we would be real world clinically applicable results. And then we also were going to people that were symptomatic. So there's an OSCI questionnaire that we give everyone. They had to score at least a 23 to be included in this study. Go ahead and uh, change slides for me. And these are the outcomes we were looking for. These are the endpoints. So the OSCI, I'm sure you're all familiar with it. It's a 12 question survey that has severity multipliers and it goes from zero to 100. Anything 12 and under is considered normal. 13 and up, little borderline, all the way up to severe with 100 score. So with OSCI, the lower the number, the better. We want to be closer to having zero symptoms. And we were also looking at the tear breakup time. So normal, we want those tears to stay stable on the eye for eight to 10 seconds. And we test this just fluorescein in the eye, having the patient blink and hold open 
and monitoring how long it takes before we see the tear film break up. So eight to 10 seconds means that your tear film is stable. Five to 10 means that you old oh, idea there. Anything less than five seconds and we're in quite a bit of trouble here. So on this, we want to see higher numbers, right? So the longer the tear break up time, the more stable the tear film is. Go ahead and change for me. So we saw patients on a baseline visit and 30 days later for a follow-up visit. We followed the exact same protocols on both days. Um, we checked vision, all the usual stuff we do. And on foot lamp, we did a very thorough lid, lashes, conch, cornea exam, right? So we were looking for lid seal issues. We were looking at the meibomian glands to see if you know they were atrophied, infiltrated, if there was overvascularization. We were looking at the natural tear prism. So before we ever put stain on the eye, we wanted to see how large that tear meniscus was. And then, of course, corneal and conjunctival staining. Go ahead and change for me. Thank you. All right, so we have our 35 subjects, and all we asked them to do was wear this heat mask, specifically a heat mask, not a damp washcloth like most people start with, because we needed five minutes of maintained heat. And the washcloth is not going to get you there. So we used this mask, asked them to wear it five minutes a day, and we used these soft gels, the Ultra Dry Eye, and they have 110 EPA, 193 milligrams of DHA in the triglyceride form, which is what we're able to absorb better. And this is important, and I'm sorry if I steal some of your thunder, David, because I know we'll be talking about nutrients in a bit, but the Omega-3, omega-6 ratio we want, we want it to be four to one. In the U.S., it's anywhere from 10 to 50 to one, which is way out of line. So we need high dose omega-3s to have an effect. And then we ask them to do this every day for 30 days. And then we had them come back in 30 days, and this is what we found. Go ahead, change. All right, so we started with that symptoms quiz, that OSDI, and when we started, we were at an average of 57 on that score, which is pretty high, and more than half of the people were actually in the severe category on that OSDI testing. And after the 30 days, they came back, and we saw a 49% decrease the average score ended up being 29. That's huge. And that's symptoms. That's really, honestly, all our patients care about, but that's huge. So now we're going to look at the signs and see how we did with tear breakup time. Go ahead and change. Perfect. So when we started, the participants had a tear breakup time of about three seconds, which is pretty dismal. We want eight to 10. And after those 30 days, we ended up with patients having 5.7 seconds. That is a huge increase in 30 days, 81%. And this is giving them all stable tear films, and this is probably why they're so much less symptomatic. And there was actually 42% of people came back reporting that they were asymptomatic, I believe. And every single participant did show a decrease in the OSDI, because we want that number to be low, and an increase in the tear breakup time, which we want to be high. And so what, what does this mean for us? So we have a very simple treatment plan. Five minutes a day with a heat mask that maintains the clinical level of heat needed, and three omega soft gels per day. That's it. So in simplifying it, we can actually treat more patients because sometimes we get all wrapped up all the treatment options and we start making things overly complicated for patients or honestly already a little scared because we just told them they have a disease they didn't know they had. So in making the treatment plan simple, 
it makes the diagnosis and understanding it a little easier on the patient. What that also does is it makes it simple enough that patients that are asymptomatic, because we need to be catching them too. I don't want to wait until patients are comfortable before we start treating their dry eye. Um, so even patients that are asymptomatic, I can explain it to them as five minutes a day and three thoughts. Right now, you brush your teeth twice a day for two minutes or four minutes, and you probably floss for at least one minute, right? So there's your five minutes. That's the dental hygiene routine you have. Now you need to have an ocular hygiene routine. And when I explain it that way, I tend to have better compliance, which in general, the more simple the treatment plan, the fewer times you have to take a medication, the better compliance we get. And dry eye non-compliance is the bane of our existence. People have dry eye. We want to do everything we can to help them. We need to make it easier for them to help themselves. Um, obviously, if you can bring patients back for follow-up visits two, three times a year, if you're billing medical insurance, and accessories. So the masks themselves and the supplements. And during the pandemic, when we first shut down, completely shut down our office, contact lens sales and accessory sales were what was keeping us afloat. That was our main source of revenue at the time. So I can't stress how important that is for your practice. Another thing that happened with the pandemic, which was interesting, is I finally started getting compliant people. I finally had everybody just sitting at home or working from home, and they were able to take a five-minute break at some point in the day. They were able to remember to take their soft gels. And the number of people that have been coming back saying that they don't feel shy anymore or they've seen a huge improvement, even I'm blown away because I've never had that before, and that's all down to compliance. So we can reach more people, we can reach our symptomatic people, improve those symptoms, and we can reach the asymptomatic people before they start having symptoms. And all with this very simple protocol. Does anybody have questions? Um, Brittany, it's Dave. Um, can you talk about, I'll give people uh, just a second to think about their questions and they can unmute themselves. Um, but can you talk about, you mentioned uh, contact lenses. And what, what can you say about, you know, contact lens dropout and dry eye and how this might, you know, help your practice uh, around contact lenses as well? Right, so that is a, an important part of it because my bromine gland disease and dry eye are the number one reason patients drop out of contact lenses. Um, they become intolerant, and now you've lost the contact lens patient that used to get a year's supply every in your office. So that plays a big role in keeping them in contact and keeping patients in contact. Yeah. Does, uh, does anyone have any questions for Brittany? Oh, I see something on the chat. You see, you see something on the chat? Yeah. Oh, they're asking for, uh, about prices, and I am not that guy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Here's, oh, here's the chat. <laughs> I, I didn't even know. I didn't know how to get into the chat. Um, how do I see that? Uh, I can. I can. Uh, yeah, I can address pricing. Um, you know, in general, you're 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 probably familiar with the PRNs and the Nordic Naturals of the world. Um, one other thing I was going to mention is Brittany talked about the the EPA DHA and and you know it was around 700. That's per soft gel, just to be clear. So so these uh, patients are getting you know over 2,000 milligrams of EPA DHA per day. That that's what they're getting in that three dose. Uh, so pricing wise for that level um you're somewhere in the 
40 to the patient, $45 a month, uh, or maybe a little less if they buy in volume. And then to you, the docs, it's, you know, about half that. So, you know, in general, we say we're about 10% less than Nordic and PRN, uh, both to the doc and to the patient. Um, so I hope that answers that question. And if you're wondering about why we care about the EPA, DHA, it's because it helps with the inflammation caused by the omega-6s. Um, and actually, we don't produce very much DHA on our own, which is important for blocking and building block of the omega-6. Um, so we actually have to get it through diet, which is why we have such a dry eye issue in the U.S., because the Western diet system. You are, you are absolutely right on that. And uh, it's, a, it's a good segue maybe to my section. And, uh, and, and if anyone else has questions, just go ahead and type them in. Of course, my uh, gardener outside my window has now decided is a good time to uh, weed whack. So hopefully, uh, hopefully it won't be too distracting. Um, and I'll let uh, Brittany, if you just want to introduce me. Sure. All right. So David Buchanan, if you don't already know, he's the founder and CEO of Occupy. He is the one that facilitated the study. It's been 24 years in the medical device industry, which is a ton. Um, and he's got his master's in nutrition. So he knows what he's talking about. And also, he's one of the only people I know that teleskis. I didn't know what that was until I met you. <laughs> well, don't get me started on that. Um, thank you, Brittany. You're so uh, All right. So let's talk about nutrient deficiencies. And, and Brittany just hit on, you know, a big one. Um, but first of all, why do we care um, about this, right? So... There goes there goes my gardener. Okay, he's leaving. Good. Um, you know, macular degeneration, as you certainly know, uh, is on the rise. I mean, this this is the prediction from the NIH, um, you know, an eighty percent increase uh, in the next thirty forty years. So that that's pretty bleak. Um, and you know, what can we do about that? Uh, I'm going to ask you all to hold on for one second. I am very sorry about that. Okay, I'm back. They they uh, decided to blow and uh, do all kinds of things outside my window, so I just had to grab them. All right, so that you know that's one of the big drivers here, and of course, what you know the risk factors for macular degeneration you're certainly aware of. Um, you know, genetics is a big one. Smoking, luckily, is on the decrease, but you know, diet. Uh, and UV blue light, and of course obesity, which mostly comes from from diet and lifestyle, it, are really the driving factors of not just macular degeneration, but all the lifestyle diseases you know that you can think of: diabetes, uh, obesity, which causes you know is a main cause of many many other diseases, including osteoarthritis, cardiovascular disease, could go on and on. So what can we do? I'm just going to talk about these key nutrients for today. Uh, Omega-3, these carotenoids, and of course, lutein and zeaxanthin, you know, really, I, I call the silver bullets of eye health, um, just tremendous clinical data uh, on its protective abilities. And then vitamin D3, which has become a very hot topic uh, lately around COVID. So let's just talk about that. But first, before we do that, take a look at this picture on the right here. Take a look at these 
you know, leafy greens, kale, spinach, collards, um, turnip greens, you know, broccoli. So these, this is what you have to eat on a daily basis. So one cup uh, cooked, that is a tremendous amount. Um, that's like a large bowl of kale. So is it any surprise, you know, that we're deficient in lutein and zeaxanthin? I mean, I, I like kale, but there's no way I'm eating a cup of it a day. Uh, so you really have to supplement to, to get to the right levels here, and I'll, I'll show you what those are. So omega-3, um, we, um, we talked about a little bit. So the average intake in the U.S. is about 100 milligrams. And what you really need is at least a thousand, a uh, thousand to fifteen hundred milligrams, and that that's across the board. If if you're looking for anti-inflammatory properties, if you're looking to help with uh, arthritis and joint pain, you need at least a thousand milligrams. Two thousand is actually a better level, and this is when we talk about a thousand milligrams or two thousand milligrams, we're talking about actual EPA and DHA not just fish oil, which is where the uh, majority of fish oil companies like to play marketing games and put, you know, 1,500 milligrams of fish oil on the front of their bottle. Well, what does that mean? That, that really doesn't mean anything. So let's look at the supplement facts to figure out what that really is delivering. Uh, we don't have time to go into um, triglyceride versus ethyl ester, but I, I think you've all probably been to enough lectures to understand that triglyceride omega-3 is really the key uh, in terms of absorption and purity, and, and that's really what you have to look for in terms of a, a supplement. But uh, Brittany touched on this omega-6 to omega-3 ratio, and that is key because of the Western diet that almost the whole world is now on is full of refined oils. Uh, and that's really what's driving the pro-inflammation. So omega-6 is what's found in these refined seed oils uh, and corn oil, which is a huge driver of inflammation and we're just not getting enough omega-3 and and as she said we have to ingest omega-3 we can't our body does not make it so it's an essential fatty acid that has to come from our diet so you know how do we do that um the benefits are many uh dry eye we talked about and also macular de degeneration you know this is not shouldn't be a surprise because if you can increase your omega-3 and improve that ratio, you reduce inflammation, which is a cause of so many uh, of these diseases. So, uh, so what the, the U.S., on average, we're getting about a 10% or less effective daily dose uh, from our diet. So here's just a little bit more on what Brittany was talking about. If you go back to our ancestors, you know, go back, 100 years ago, 150 years ago, you'll see that the ratio of omega-6 to omega-3 was about one to one. Well, why is that? Think about it. Prior to 1900 or so, we didn't have refined oils. You, you, you didn't have, uh, you didn't have bottles of uh, corn oil to be uh, poured and used <laughs> in every a piece of baked goods and and also packaged food really did not exist right so packaged food is laden with this omega-6 that's pro-inflammatory so if you think about what the western world is eating now fast food of course as well so one to one in a hundred years or so we've gone to on average at least 15 to one omega-6 to omega-3 but if you can get that ratio back down to four to one, that is where there are a ton of health benefits and you're really uh, kind of maximizing your abilities there in terms of inflammation. And you can certainly do that by reducing, oh great, um, your consumption of uh, 
sorry, my screen just flipped on me. There we go. Um, you can reduce your omega-6 intake, of course, uh, and you should, but you also need to increase that omega-3. And you know, if you think about it, trying to get a couple thousand milligrams of omega-3 per day, you would have to eat a salmon filet and not a, not a store farmed wild salmon, but a, or sorry, a, a salmon, a wild caught salmon that actually has 2000 milligrams of omega-3 because a store uh, farm raised salmon has a ton of omega-6 in it as well as omega-3 because they feed a lot of these farmed fish uh, corn, <laughs> just like cows. So you really need what? So none of us is eating uh, a wild salmon fillet per day, uh, and if you did, you would probably have mercury poisoning anyway. So there's really no way to get there except supplementing. So this is this is one that I've always liked. Um, if you go back and look at the research on omega three, where did all this start? It came from Denmark, uh, and Denmark actually owns Greenland. And they, they were doing research on uh, the native people of Greenland. And what they found was because of their diet, you can imagine they're eating, you know, whale blubber and uh, seal and other kinds of fish. Uh, their percent of EPA in their blood is, you know, 20 times what it is in the U.S. And their omega-6 to omega-3 ratio is one-to-one. -one. Uh, they're not eating, you know, a lot of the uh, packaged foods and corn, uh, you know, corn oil that we are. Uh, and look at the cardiovascular mortality rate. And Japan, of course, eats a lot of sushi um, and, and not as much uh, junk food as we do. Uh, and look at these cardiovascular mortality rates you know, 7% for Greenland Eskimos. And it, uh, it, this has been redone actually in the U.S. as well with uh, Alaskan natives, and they found a very similar outcome, even though um, they do have obesity, you know, almost on par with the average American population, but their ratio is still very good and their EPA is very high. So I think this is this is really kind of the big picture that that you need to understand on omega six omega three. Right. Okay, so moving on to my favorite uh, carotenoids of lutein and zeaxanthin. Again, I I kind of touched on this earlier. Look at how much uh, a, you know a cup. If you think about a cooked down cup of these leafy greens, it's no surprise when I show you that you know the average daily intake in the US of lutein is less than a uh it's about a milligram and zeaxanthin is less than one milligram. Uh you need at least six uh milligrams of lutein, ten is better, and there's some data that says you know 14 to 20 uh is, is even more beneficial. Um zeaxanthin you know, it's a stereoisomer of lutein, so it's a, they're very similar. Um, but uh, you only need about two milligrams of that. Uh, tremendous benefits for the macula of the eye, as you certainly know. I'm sure you're all familiar with ARED2. Um, but, you know, also not only macular degeneration, but risk reduction of cataracts. Now, why would that be? Because these are antioxidants. And cataracts, um, are developed from free radicals. That's, that's how cataracts develop. So if you are loaded with antioxidants that can uh, neutralize the free radicals, you are at least going to push off those cataracts to, uh, you know, some years later in your life uh, or, you know, uh, push, them, push them off quite away. So these are huge numbers. Uh, and you can do this very simply by dosing, uh, you know, a daily dose with this. So again, we're at about a 17% uh, effective daily dose for the U.S. population. And I thought I always thought this was very interesting. So you're all familiar with A Reds too. So look at the cohort of A Reds too is right here in red. This is compared to 18 other 18 other 
a study cohorts uh, that had lutein and zeaxanthin um, dietary levels. So we talked about the average American is, you know, two two milligrams, uh, or let's say three, two two and a half to three, somewhere in here. Um, the A red, or yeah, two actually. So the A reds cohort, which we know had tremendous benefit in slowing the progression of macular degeneration, was actually uh, was in you know taking more, not taking, but getting in their diet more lutein and zeaxanthin than these sixteen other major studies have been done. So you could imagine that there could be even more benefit to the average American who's sitting somewhere more like here in the two milligram range. Um, you know, there's possibly more benefit for them to be supplementing because they they actually have even lower levels uh, than AREDS too. So I thought that was pretty interesting. So let's talk about vitamin D3 uh, quickly here. So average in the U.S., about 300 IUs uh, from the diet. Now, you know, as I'm sure you all know, vitamin D3 should be derived from exposure to the sun. Um, now, uh, I live in San Diego, sunny California, and uh, I, I'm outside a lot doing activities. And, you know, uh, theoretically, I should not need to supplement with D3. But uh, without supplementation, my D3 levels are somewhere in the 30s, which is too low, way too low. And the reason being is I'm also of Irish descent. Uh, so to, to make vitamin D3, I would need to have half my body in the sun between 12 and 2 uh, with no sunscreen and half my body exposed uh, to the sun. So basically shirtless with no sunscreen. If I did that for 20 minutes in the middle of the day, uh, I would be as red as a lobster. And uh, I can't imagine what my, you know, skin cancer situation would be. So, uh, you know, the issue is even if you can get in the sun and half the world um, can't even make D3 from sun uh, because of uh, in the wintertime, fall to winter, because of the... Um, because of the uh, angle of the sun. So, you know, half the world has to supplement regardless. And really, you know, it's more than half Americans are deficient in vitamin D3. So that's the bottom line. And you just don't get much from your diet, basically. Uh, you need at least a thousand IUs uh, to increase your, uh, to, to really keep your levels up. Um, and if you're deficient, you, you need much more than that. Uh, you only get about three points per thousand IUs uh, per day. So uh, some people might need two or even 5,000 a day. Uh, but again, big uh, risk reduction for AMD here. Um, and we're only at about a 30% effective dose. And then I'm sure you've all been hearing, you know, different um, reports on vitamin D3. And, you know, I don't want to uh, say that vitamin D3 is, uh, you know, is a panacea for uh, COVID because I don't think it is. But I do believe um, that it definitely boosts, you know, it, it certainly boosts the immune system. And there have been studies for 20 years that show it reduces your risk of respiratory infection. So regular flu, just standard respiratory infections, and of course COVID uh, as well. So there, there are many studies underway, but there are already several studies, um, you know, epidemiological studies from populations that show uh, an inverse relationship between the levels of vitamin D in the blood and the incidence uh, and mortality rate in European countries. Uh, and there's also, uh, you know, data that shows that the severity of sickness increases when your levels are low. So, I mean, this is pretty, uh, this is pretty unique that six different societies came out with a joint statement 
and said, you know, we, we strongly recommend that everyone supplement with 400 to 1,000 IUs of vitamin D daily. And that just came out uh, in August, actually. So, uh, again, I'm sure you're probably aware of this, but uh, if you can get your vitamin D3 in one of the supplements you're already taking, you know, all the better. And, and really, that's kind of the approach that we take. Um, you'll notice that most of our form, all our formulas have vitamin D3 in them, um, but also lutein, uh, at, at least lutein, and, and most of them zeaxanthin as well. Um, just because, on on average, uh, we're all deficient in these uh, in these uh, carotenoids and vitamins. So let's, uh, given that, let's talk about you know what we've done with a couple of our formulas, um, and. You know, we talked a lot about omega-3, and, and I briefly touched on, you know, the differences. And, and again, I think you've all probably been to many lectures that talk about omega-3, so I won't uh, go over all those things. But I do want to point out that we are the only um, dry eye company that has sourced their omega-3 in Alaska from wild-caught fish. And we're also the only, you know, I'd, I'd say premium dry eye products that is sourced and refined completely in the United States. Uh, the other, you know, companies that I mentioned, PRN, Nordic Naturals, uh, are getting their fish from kind of all over the world and uh, processed in Norway and Germany and then shipped over here. Uh, a lot of fossil fuels, a lot of a long chain uh, of um, supply. Ours are wild caught in Alaska, put on a train car, uh, frozen actually on the boat, on a train car. Train car comes off, goes on a train track, goes right to Ohio, and is refined into an ultra-pure uh, triglyceride omega-3. So we're, we're really proud of that. It was something I'd been searching for for years. And up until a couple of years ago, it just wasn't available. We did, uh, no one made the purity uh, of omega-3 that we need, that we want to deliver to our customers. So we're really happy when we're able to uh, partner up with a company in Alaska. Uh, also, sustainable fishery. Um, the, the fishing grounds there in Alaska, uh, among the most highly sustainable in the world, uh, will not be overfished. Uh, product is NSF certified, which means third party tested. And then, of course, our product is uh, tested by lot as well. So, each, so rest assured that, you know, the omega 3 you're taking and you're recommending to your patients is uh, certified by lot. So, after it's manufactured, it's tested uh, for purity to make sure there are no contaminants and also meets European standard, which is the highest standard in the world for purity, oxidation, contaminants. Uh, so we take this very seriously. So all that being said, so I believe we are now the only company that has an AREDS2 formula with uh, triglyceride omega-3 right in the formula. So we took our ultramacular, which we've had for years, and we did a couple of things. We doubled the lutein and zeaxanthin. So now you're getting 20 milligrams lutein and four of zeaxanthin. And we added 300 milligrams of triglyceride omega-3. And it's still only two so uh, soft gels, small soft gels, actually 500 milligrams, so easy to swallow. And of course, we also have uh, 19 other essential vitamins and minerals, and lycopene and bilberry on top of the AREDS too. So this is not only a multivitamin, but it's an eye-specific multivitamin with a very good dose of omega-3. So just as a comparison, 300 milligrams of omega-3 is quite a bit more than a 1,500 milligram Nature's Made or any of those other supermarket pills uh, that are huge. They're, they're like a horse pill, but they're so low in purity um, that they, they're 1,500 milligrams. They deliver 300, but then they're an ethyl ester. So they don't actually, you only absorb about 30% of that. So this is equal to about three supermarket pills, uh, this dose. So uh, all of that, and, you know, this is about $30 a month. 
So uh, really hard to beat the combination that's in these uh, product and very easy to swallow as well. On top of that, we, we launched because of, you know, all those risk factors that we mentioned. Uh, if you don't have macular degeneration, I really don't recommend that you take the AREDS formula. Uh, it's a heavy amount of minerals that unless you've got a real good reason for taking them, I really wouldn't suggest. But if you have, uh, you know, genetics, uh, you have people in your family who have macular degeneration. If you've got some of these other risk factors in terms of, you know, UV blue light exposure, maybe you work outside all the time, um, you know, many other factors, smoking, a lot of fried foods, bad diet. Um, so we would recommend this ultra vision, which essentially is one of the ultra macular per day, but we've, we've kind of turned it into a macular, uh, macula protection, uh, you know, defensive product. So you're getting the full dose lutein and zeaxanthin that'll help reduce the risk of developing, you know, these uh, macular issues as well as cataracts. And you're still getting a nice dose uh, of omega-3, lycopene bilberry, all the essential vitamins and minerals. One soft gel a day, I mean, you know, this is like $15 a day. This is a tremendous um, eye vitamin that uh, I don't think there's anything else like it. Um, so take a look at that. And then... Um, I know, you know, Brittany talked about compresses, as you all probably know. I mean, this is a tried and true um, product for dry eye. You know, I, I use them um, five minutes a day. You know, I tell people, hey, it's a, you know, take it as your, your five-minute meditation. You know, relax. Uh, it feels great. It's uh, very calming and soothing to wear this. Um, but we just came out with a brand new compress that has a lot of features that no other compress has. Um, you'll notice that we're able to actually put your logo right on the outside. So this is new. We are never able to do this before. Um, we've now kind of flipped it around and our machine washable cover is now the outside. And all you do is take the insert out and you put this in the wash. So I'm going to go ahead and show you just a two-minute video here on some of the new features. Um, I think you can explain it in a, a more efficient manner than I can, and you'll have some visuals as well.
Okay, so that that's the uh, that's the new compress, and uh, I think you saw we we did quite a few new things there, including a, a zipper for loading and and uh, you know making that very easy instead of the old Velcro system that we had. Um, it's also just a more contoured fit. We heard many times that um, it was a bit too large, and especially you know ladies um, didn't fit very well. Um, so, sorry about that. That's uh, that's another YouTube video that I don't think we want to watch. Um, how do I stop that? There we go. So, all right. So, just real quick, I'm just gonna, you know, a couple of slides left here. Um, and just, just to, you know, I know there's some questions about, you know, what the different products were. So, the the product. Um, well, this is actually the half size. So our ultra dry ITG that Brittany talked about that was used in the study, um, we came out with a half size version. So this is a 500 milligram pill, really easy to swallow. Uh, and the other thing we did was this has a full dose of lutein and zeaxanthin. So it's got the 10 and 2, 1500 IUs of D3. It also has vitamin B12. Um, all of our products come with a 30-day money-back guarantee and a no fishy burps guarantee. Um, I know people laugh when I say that, but it's really the number one complaint of patients is those fishy burps that they get from taking this, you know, kind of supermarket fish oil, um, which is caused by the form. It's the ethyl ester omega-3, where the triglyceride form is stable. And, and doesn't oxidize in the bottle, which is really what it is. That, that fish oil is going rancid is why it causes those nasty uh, fish burps and things. So that's the half size. This is the full size that was used in the study, uh, a little over 2,000 milligrams omega-3, uh, still 10 milligrams of lutein, and 1,500 uh, I use a D3. Again, no one else offers this. Um, this kind of triglyceride omega-3 with a full dose of lutein and D3. All of this and, and our pricing is still a bit better uh, than PRN and Nordic Naturals. I think you're going to find for their standard, you know, dry eye formula. Uh, again, wild caught in Alaska. This is three a day. Uh, this is a standard one gram pill. So pretty easy to swallow for most people. But I personally take the half size because I want the, the B12 and the zeaxanthin. Um, and that, that's it on the products. And then just, you know, you're all going to receive, uh, you know, as a thank you for attending today. We really appreciate it. We appreciate your time. And you're all going to receive a, um, a dry eye starter kit, which is a, uh, you know, kitted dry eye compress, uh, the new one that you saw there in the video and uh, our ultra dry eye so that comes you know in its own box and you can actually stock that as a kit in your practice uh, as well as uh, a bottle of the ultra macular that we talked about uh, but i also wanted to offer something we've never done before um, with a purchase of three cases of any of the supplements you can mix and match them uh, we're going to offer you 40 free of the custom logo compresses um, we don't normally it's usually uh, 80 minimum just to even order them because you can imagine we have to get them printed and things. Um, but I wanted to, you know, offer that as, as something to get uh, people uh, started with that. I think you're going to do really well uh, with those compresses. Um, so thank you very much for your time. I do appreciate it. And uh, I'll turn it over. Uh, here is a, here's a, it's actually a picture that I took uh, in Alaska. Um, on one of my ski trips, so uh, it's a little bit up there. It's so beautiful. But uh, any questions uh, on anything that we've covered today? Uh, and if I can figure out how to open this chat, I'll do that. But uh, if you want to just unmute yourself, uh, unless I have the control here, uh, no. Chat. How do I read the chat? Hmm. Don't know. Brittany, how did you, you saw the chat earlier, how'd you do that? What kind of magic? I don't know. Can you hear me? Yes. 
Okay, good. I muted myself. Um, so it should be if you bring the cursor down towards the bottom of the screen, a little menu should yeah. pop up. And then you just click chat. Huh. Is that working for you? Um, no. Um, well, is there anything on the chat that we should address if you can see it? Uh, let's see. Can the pouch go in the microwave? Sorry? Can the pouch go in the microwave? Oh, absolutely, yeah. So the, the compress itself with the machine washable cover, you know, it comes all loaded with the compress. So we'll, the compress is the insert, we'll call it. And it's certainly made to go in the microwave. You can even hand wash the whole thing, you know, with uh, cold water if you want to. But it's really designed to use for a few days, a week, however you want to use it and then unzip it, pull the insert out, the compress, and then just put the cover in the washing machine. So uh, just wash it and then let it, let it line dry. I think the dryer would be a little rough on it, um, but that, that's how it's, it's designed. Uh, but yeah, certainly the whole thing goes in the microwave. You don't have to load it and unload it each time, no. Yeah. So there are a couple people asking if patients can reorder and direct ship to their home. But the office oh, yeah. credit. That's a great question, especially in times of uh, COVID, right? Absolutely. Um, we offer, you know, the, the product uh, is on our website, but you do need a doctor's PIN number to order it. So the way that works is um, you just, it's a one pager that you fill out with us, a referral uh, uh, account. And we assign you a PIN number, and we'll also actually give you a, a prescription pad with a little coupon on it for your patients. And you just put your PIN number on there so that when they call us or order through our website, um, they are required to enter a PIN number. And that way, uh, you will get 20% uh, credit on every purchase forever. And uh, we send out a quarterly uh, check on that. So uh, that works really well. And in fact, our most successful doctors um, stock the product, especially like this starter kit. You know, it's got a, a one month supply of omega 3 in it, plus the compress. Get them started on that, have them come back. Maybe they buy a couple months. But then, you know, if they're, if you live in a, you know, state where people are driving an hour to come to you, um, you know, they'll just reorder online or call us. And, and we're very good about, you know, basically figuring, you know, figuring out who their doctor is, even if they don't know their PIN number. Um, so, yeah, absolutely. They can you know, reorder or we ship directly to the patients for free. Yeah. Do you suggest that people take the ultra dry eye with a meal? Uh, great question. Uh, so, all, not just omega-3, but all supplements. Uh, I strongly recommend take them immediately before a meal. In fact, on our on our label, it actually says uh, take soft gels immediately before a meal for best absorption. And the reason being, and and when I say immediately, I mean you know uh, ten seconds before. The reason being is you take the supplement and then you eat, and when you eat the motility of your stomach increases, uh, your hydrochloric acid increases, and basically your digestion and your absorption is quicker uh, because your whole digestive process is working. So that's always the best way to take supplements. And, uh, you know, all, people also ask me, well, gee, you know, the, the dose is five of the mini soft gels. Do you take them all at once? Well, I take them all at once. I take them every morning right before breakfast, and I do that because I cannot remember to take them later. So uh, certainly if you took them throughout the day, that's great. I just know I'm not going to remember that. Um, and, you know, I think the other question typically is GI issues. And, you know, Brittany and I were talking about this the other day. You know, we, we certainly did not see that in our clinical study. And, you know, over 10 years that OcuSci has been in business, I, I don't know if I've ever heard of, of GI issues. And again, that typically comes from the oxidized fish oil. 
and that's the ethyl ester stuff. It's actually going rancid and oxidizing in the bottle. That's clinically proven because you can you can test the oxidation. So ours uh, has very, very little oxidation. It's one of the things that we test, and it will not um, oxidize any further because it's a stable molecule. So that's really what causes the GI issues. So another question was, do we have a way to measure the omega-3 levels in our patients to show improvement? I can yeah. say. Yeah. Go ahead. Oh, you have an option? Go for it. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the answer is absolutely yes. Um, we used to carry that test. Um, we don't any longer, it just, we just, you know, didn't have enough volume to kind of make it worthwhile for the lab to label it for us and all those things. Um, but there, there are a couple of labs out there. And in fact, we did our own study. Um, so, so I will, I will uh, send a link to everyone here on the, on the webinar for that, uh, for those labs. Um, in the past, I haven't checked it lately, but it used to be about a hundred bucks to get an omega-3 test, but it is a great report to have. Um, we actually did a test with one of our clinics uh, up in uh, Washington State. Uh, he, wanted to, he wanted to see, he improved to his staff that this really worked. So uh, I think there were nine, nine staff and they, they took it pretty seriously. They did a 60 day, um, you know, no supplementation, uh, did a baseline omega-3 blood test, and then took the R uh, omega-3 dry dose for 60 days and did a follow-up test. And they had an 80% increase in their omega-3 levels in 60 days. And their average was, and I can send you this as well, I'll, I'll send this out as well, um, their average Omega-6 to omega-3 ratio was right there around 15, just like the average U.S. And afterwards, it was about 8. So, I mean, it is pretty powerful. Um, and it's a really nice report that you get. It's not just omega-3. It's EPA, DHA. It's the ratios. And uh, I think it's really good. And I, I think that's a great idea um, to do as well. So I will follow up with those two things to everybody. So in clinic... I actually have a, a video of the oil film so they can see that. Not that that's the direct correlation. Honestly, it's the symptoms quiz that I can show study progression on. And honestly, every once in a while, you get a patient that takes it, is taking it, doesn't believe it works, then stops. Then they're back in the office saying, I stopped taking it and I feel worse because it was working in the first place. Clinically, that's the only way I've done it. But so, Brittany, Brittany, I missed. We, uh, I don't know if everyone could hear that, but I didn't hear. What was the question you were addressing? Oh, it was just how do we show patients progress? Right. So, so you're talking, you're talking about the OSDI using the OSDI as an objective measure. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I think, I think that's really, you know, gold standard. Uh, you know, use that OSDI or the speed score, which is even quicker. Um, use that in your intake, you know, as your as the patient is doing their intake, um, I think that's what you call it, uh, their paperwork, and just have that as a standard so that you can quickly look at it and say, gee, you're a, you know, you're a 59. You know, how do your, how do your eyes feel? And, I mean, Brittany, you can speak to this better than I can, but I think it's really nice to have an objective number, you were a 59, now you're a 32, you know, and I think that helps kind of reinforce, because like you said, sometimes they get used to the new normal and they don't really know where they were. And I think that was all of the questions. All right, well, great, great questions. Um, well, again, thank you everyone for participating. Brittany, thank you very much for your excellent presentation as always. Um,